Anton Chekhov Anton Pavlovich Chekhov was a Russian physician, dramaturge and author who is considered to be among the greatest writers of short stories in history. His career as a dramatist produced four classics and his best short stories are held in high esteem by writers and critics. Chekhov practiced as a medical doctor throughout most of his literary career, medicine is my lawful wife, he once said, and literature is my mistress. Chekhov renounced the theater after the disastrous reception of The Seagull in 1896, but the play was revived to acclaim in 1898 by Konstantin Stanislavsky's Moscow Art Theater, which subsequently also produced Chekhov's uncle Vanya and premiered his last two plays, Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard. These four works present a challenge to the acting ensemble as well as to audiences, because in place of conventional action Chekhov offers a theater of mood, and a submerged life in the text. Chekhov had at first written stories only for financial gain, but as his artistic ambition grew, he made formal innovations which have influenced the evolution of the modern short story. His originality consists in an early use of the stream of consciousness technique, later adopted by James Joyce and other modernists, combined with a disavowal of the moral finality of traditional story structure. He made no apologies for the difficulties this posed to readers, insisting that the role of an artist was to ask questions, not to answer them. Biography Childhood Anton Chekhov was born on the feast day of Saint Anthony the Great, January 17 Old Style, January 29, 1860, the third of six surviving children, in Taganrog, a port on the Sea of Atsev in southern Russia. His father, Pavel Yegorovich Chekhov, the son of a former serf, was from a village Vilkhovatka near Kobylyaki, Poltava region, and ran a grocery store. A director of the parish choir, devout Orthodox Christian, and physically abusive father, Pavel Shekhov has been seen by some historians as the model for his son's many portraits of hypocrisy. Shekhov's mother, Yuvenia, was an excellent storyteller who entertained the children with tales of her travels with her cloth merchant father all over Russia. Our talents we got from our father, Shekhov remembered, but our soul from our mother. In adulthood, Shekhov criticized his brother Alexander's treatment of his wife and children by reminding him of Pavel's tyranny. Shekhov attended a school for Greek boys, followed by the Takenrog Gymnasium, now renamed the Shekhov Gymnasium, where he was kept down for a year at 15 for failing a Greek exam. He sang at the Greek Orthodox monastery in Takenrog and in his father's choirs. In a letter of 1892, he used the word suffering to describe his childhood and recalled. Despite having a religious background and education, he later became an atheist. In 1876, Shekhov's father was declared bankrupt after overextending his finances building a new house, and to avoid the debtor's prison fled to Moscow, where his two eldest sons, Alexander and Nikolay, were attending university. The family lived in poverty in Moscow, Shekhov's mother physically and emotionally broken. Shekhov was left behind to sell the family possessions and finish his education. Shekhov remained in Taganrog for three more years, boarding with a man called Zalivanov who, like Lopakhin in the Cherry Orchard, had bailed out the family for the price of their house. Shekhov had to pay for his own education, which he managed by, among other jobs, private tutoring, catching and selling gold finches and selling short sketches to the newspapers. He sent every ruble he could spare to Moscow, along with humorous letters to cheer up the family. During this time, he read widely and analytically, including Cervantes, Turgenev, Gonkarov, and Schopenhauer. And he wrote a full-length comedy drama, Fatherless, which his brother Alexander dismissed as an inexcusable though innocent fabrication. Shekhov also enjoyed a series of love affairs, one with the wife of a teacher. In 1879, Shekhov completed his schooling and joined his family in Moscow, having gained admission to the medical school at I. M. Sashin of First Moscow State Medical University. Early Writings Shekhov now assumed responsibility for the whole family. To support them and to pay his tuition fees, he wrote daily short, humorous sketches and vignettes of contemporary Russian life 
many under pseudonyms such as Antoshich Conti, Antoshich Conti, and Man Without a Spleen, Chalabek Bezsil Zenki. His prodigious output gradually earned him a reputation as a satirical chronicler of Russian street life, and by 1882 he was writing for a Skokie, Fragments, owned by Nikolai Lakin, one of the leading publishers of the time. Shekhov's tone at this stage was harsher than that familiar from his mature fiction. In 1884, Shekhov qualified as a physician, which he considered his principal profession though he made little money from it and treated the poor free of charge. In 1884 and 1885, Shekhov found himself coughing blood, and in 1886 the attacks worsened. But he would not admit tuberculosis to his family and friends, confessing to Lakin, I am afraid to submit myself to be sounded by my colleagues. He continued writing for weekly periodicals, earning enough money to move the family into progressively better accommodation. Early in 1886 he was invited to write for one of the most popular papers in St. Petersburg, Novoi Vremya, New Times, owned and edited by the millionaire magnate Alexei Savorin, who paid per line a rate double Lakins and allowed him three times the space. Savorin was to become a lifelong friend, perhaps Chekhov's closest. Before long, Chekhov was attracting literary as well as popular attention. The 64-year-old Dmitry Grigorovich, a celebrated Russian writer of the day, wrote to Chekhov after reading his short story The Huntsman, You have real talent, a talent which places you in the front rank among writers in the new generation. He went on to advise Chekhov to slow down, write less, and concentrate on literary quality. Shekhov replied that the letter had struck him like a thunderbolt, and confessed, I have written my stories the way reporters write up their notes about fires, mechanically, half-consciously, caring nothing about either the reader or myself. The admission may have done Shekhov a disservice, since early manuscripts reveal that he often wrote with extreme care, continually revising. Gregor Beach's advice nevertheless inspired a more serious, artistic ambition in the 26 year old. In 1887, with a little string pulling by Gregor Beach, the short story collection at dusk, V. Suma Kark, won Chekhov the coveted Pushkin Prize for the best literary production distinguished by high artistic worth. Turning points That year, exhausted from overwork and ill health, Shekhov took a trip to Ukraine which reawakened him to the beauty of the steppe. On his return, he began the novella-length short story The Step, something rather odd and much too original, eventually published in Seveny Vesnik, The Northern Herald. In a narrative which drifts with the thought processes of the characters, Shekhov evokes a chaise journey across the steppe through the eyes of a young boy sent to live away from home, his companions a priest and a merchant. The Step which has been called a dictionary of Chekhov's poetics, represented a significant advance for Chekhov, exhibiting much of the quality of his mature fiction and winning him publication in a literary journal rather than a newspaper. In autumn 1887, a theatre manager named Korsh commissioned Chekhov to write a play, the result being Ivanov, written in a fortnight and produced that November. Though Chekhov found the experience sickening, and painted a comic portrait of the chaotic production in a letter to his brother Alexander, the play was a hit and was praised, to Shekhov's bemusement, as a work of originality. Mikhail Shekhov considered Ivanov a key moment in his brother's intellectual development and literary career. From this period comes an observation of Chekhov's which has become known as Shekhov's gun, noted by Ilya Gerlion from a conversation, if an actor you have a pistol hanging on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. The death of Chekhov's brother Nikolai from tuberculosis in 1889 influenced a dreary story, finished that September, about a man who confronts the end of a life which he realizes has been without purpose. Mikhail Chekhov, who recorded his brother's depression and restlessness after Nikolai's death, was researching prisons at the time as part of his law studies, and Anton Chekhov, in a search for purpose in his own life, himself soon became obsessed with the issue of prison reform. Sakhalin In 1890, Shekhov undertook an arduous journey by train, horse-drawn carriage, and river steamer to the far east of Russia and the Katorga, or penal colony, on Sakhalin Island, north of Japan, 
where he spent three months interviewing thousands of convicts and settlers for a census. The letters Shekha wrote during the two-and-a-half-month journey to Sorkhalin are considered to be among his best. His remarks to his sister about Tomsk were to become notorious. The inhabitants of Tomsk later retaliated by erecting a mocking statue of Chekhov. Chekhov witnessed much on Sorkhalin that shocked and angered him, including floggings, embezzlement of supplies, and forced prostitution of women. He wrote, There were times I felt that I saw before me the extreme limits of man's degradation. He was particularly moved by the plight of the children living in the penal colony with their parents. For example, Shekhov later concluded that charity and subscription were not the answer, but that the government had a duty to finance humane treatment of the convicts. His findings were published in 1893 and 1894 as Ostrov Sokhalin, The Island of Sokhalin, a work of social science, not literature, worthy and informative rather than brilliant. Shekhov found literary expression for the hell of Sokhalin in his long short story The Murder, the last section of which is set on Sorkhalin, where the murderer Yakov loads coal in the night, longing for home. Shekhov's writing on Sorkhalin is the subject of brief comment and analysis in Japanese writer Hayuki Murakami's novel 1Q84. Malikavo In 1892, Shekhov bought the small country estate of Malikovo, about 40 miles south of Moscow, where he lived until 1899 with his family. It's nice to be a lord, he joked to his friend Ivan Lentyev, who wrote humorous pieces under the pseudonym Shchikov, but he took his responsibilities as a landlord seriously and soon made himself useful to the local peasants. As well as organizing relief for victims of the famine and cholera outbreaks of 1892, he went on to build three schools, a fire station, and a clinic, and to donate his medical services to peasants for miles around despite frequent recurrences of his tuberculosis. Mikhail Shekhov, a member of the household at Malikovo, described the extent of his brother's medical commitments. Shekhov's expenditure on drugs was considerable, but the greatest cost was making journeys of several hours to visit the sick, which reduced his time for writing. Shekhov's work as a doctor, however, enriched his writing by bringing him into intimate contact with all sections of Russian society. For example, he witnessed at first hand the peasants' unhealthy and cramped living conditions, which he recalled in his short story Peasants. Shekhov visited the upper classes as well, recording in his notebook, Aristocrats. The same ugly bodies in physical and cleanliness, the same toothless old age and disgusting death, as with market women. Shekhov began writing his play The Seagull in 1894, in a lodge he had built in the orchard at Malikovo. In the two years since moving to the estate, he had refurbished the house, taken up agriculture and horticulture, tended orchard and pond, and planted many trees, which, according to Mikhail, he looked after. As though they were his children. Like Colonel Vershinin and his three sisters, as he looked at them he dreamed of what they would be like in three or four hundred years. The first night of the Seagull on October 17, 1896 at the Alexandrinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg was a fiasco, booed by the audience, and the play's reception stung Shekhov into renouncing the theatre. But the play so impressed the theatre director Vladimir Nemirovich Danchenko that he convinced his colleague Konstantin Stanislavsky to direct it for the innovative Moscow Art Theatre in 1898. Stanislavsky's attention to psychological realism and ensemble playing coaxed the buried subtleties from the text and restored Shekhov's interest in playwriting. The Art Theatre commissioned more plays from Shekhov and the following year staged Uncle Vanya, which Shekhov had completed in 1896. Yalta In March 1897 Shekhov suffered a major hemorrhage of the lungs while on a visit to Moscow. With great difficulty he was persuaded to enter a clinic, where the doctors diagnosed tuberculosis on the upper part of his lungs and ordered a change in his manner of life. After his father's death in 1898, Shekhov bought a plot of land on the outskirts of Yalta and built a villa there, into which he moved with his mother and sister the following year. Though he planted trees and flowers in Yalta, kept dogs and tame cranes, and received guests such as Leo Tolstoy and Maxim Gorky, 
Shekhov was always relieved to leave his hot Siberia for Moscow or travels abroad. He vowed to move to Taganrog as soon as a water supply was installed there. In Yalta he completed two more plays for the art theatre, composing with greater difficulty than in the days when he wrote serenely, The Way I Eat Pancakes Now. He took a year each over three sisters and the cherry orchard. On May 25, 1901 Shekhov married Olga Nipper, quietly, owing to his horror of weddings, a former protégé and sometime lover of Nemirovich Danchenko whom he had first met at rehearsals for The Seagull. Up to that point, Shekhov, called Russia's most elusive literary bachelor, had preferred passing liaisons and visits to brothels over commitment. He had once written to Savorin. The letter proved prophetic of Chekhov's marital arrangements with Olga, he lived largely at Yalta, she in Moscow, pursuing her acting career. In 1902, Olga suffered a miscarriage. And Donald Rayfield has offered evidence, based on the couple's letters, that conception may have occurred when Chekhov and Olga were apart, although Russian scholars have refuted that claim. The literary legacy of this long-distance marriage is a correspondence which preserves gems of theatre history, including shared complaints about Stanislavski's directing methods and Shekhov's advice to Olga about performing in his plays. In Yalta, Shekhov wrote one of his most famous stories, The Lady with the Dog, also called Lady with Lapdog, which depicts what at first seems a casual liaison between a married man and a married woman in Yalta. Neither expects anything lasting from the encounter, but they find themselves drawn back to each other, risking the security of their family lives. Death By May 1904, Shekhov was terminally ill with tuberculosis. Mikhail Shekhov recalled that everyone who saw him secretly thought the end was not far off, but the nearer was to the end, the less he seemed to realize it. On June 3 he set off with Olga for the German spa town of baden wheeler in the Black Forest, from where he wrote outwardly jovial letters to his sister Masha describing the food and surroundings and assuring her and his mother that he was getting better. In his last letter, he complained about the way the German women dressed. Shekhov's death has become one of the great set pieces of literary history, retold, embroidered, and fictionalized many times since, notably in the short story Errand by Raymond Carver. In 1908, Olga wrote this account of her husband's last moments. Shekhov's body was transported to Moscow in a refrigerated railway car for fresh oysters, a detail which offended Gorky. Some of the thousands of mourners followed the funeral procession of a general Keller by mistake, to the accompaniment of a military band. Shekhov was buried next to his father at the Novodevichy Cemetery. Legacy A few months before he died, Shekhov told the writer Ivan Bunin he thought people might go on reading him for seven years. Why seven? asked Bunin. Well, seven and a half, Shekhov replied. That's not bad. I've got six years to live. Always modest. Shekhov could hardly have imagined the extent of his posthumous reputation. The ovations for the play, The Cherry Orchard, in the year of his death showed him how high he had risen in the affection of the Russian public, by then he was second in literary celebrity only to Tolstoy, who outlived him by six years, but after his death, Shekhov's fame soon spread further afield. Constance Garnett's translations won him an English-language readership and the admiration of writers such as James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and Catherine Mansfield. The issues surrounding the close similarities between Mansfield's 1910 story The Child Who Was Tired, and Shekhov's Sleepy are summarized in William H. News reading Mansfield and Metaphors of Reform The Russian critic D. S. Mirsky, who lived in England, explained Shekhov's popularity in that country by his unusually complete rejection of what we may call the heroic values. In Russia itself, Shekhov's drama fell out of fashion after the revolution but was later adapted to the Soviet agenda, with the character Lopakhin, for example, reinvented as a hero of the New Order, taking an axe to the cherry orchard. One of the first non-Russians to praise Shekhov's plays was George Bernard Shaw, who subtitled his Heartbreak House of Fantasia in the Russian manner on English themes, and noted similarities between the predicament of the British landed class and that of their Russian counterparts as depicted by Shekhov, the same nice people, 
the same utter futility. In America, Shekhub's reputation began its rise slightly later, partly through the influence of Stanislavski's system of acting, with its notion of subtext. Shekhov often expressed his thought not in speeches, wrote Stanislavski, but in pauses or between the lines or in replies consisting of a single word. The characters often feel and think things not expressed in the lines they speak. The group theatre, in particular, developed the subtextual approach to drama, influencing generations of American playwrights, screenwriters, and actors, including Clifford Oditz, Eli Kazan and, in particular, Lee Strasberg. In turn, Strasberg's Actors Studio and the method acting approach influenced many actors, including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro, though by then the Shekhov tradition may have been distorted by a preoccupation with realism. In 1981, the playwright Tennessee Williams adapted The Seagull as the notebook of Triggerin. One of Anton's nephews, Michael Shekhov would also contribute heavily to modern theatre, particularly through his unique acting methods which differed from Stanislavski's. Despite Chekhov's eminence as a playwright, some writers believe his short stories represent the greater achievement. Raymond Carver, who wrote the short story errand about Chekhov's death, believed Chekhov the greatest of all short story writers. Ernest Hemingway, another writer influenced by Chekhov, was more grudging, Chekhov wrote about six good stories but he was an amateur writer. And Vladimir Nabokov once complained of Chekhov's medley of dreadful prosaisms, ready-made epithets, repetitions. But he also declared The Lady with the Dog one of the greatest stories ever written, and described Chekhov as writing the way one person relates to another the most important things in his life, slowly and yet without a break, in a slightly subdued voice. For the writer William Boyd. Chekhov's breakthrough was to abandon what William Girardi called the event plot for something more blurred, interrupted, mauled or otherwise tampered with by life. Virginia Woolf mused on the unique quality of a Chekhov story in The Common Reader, 1925. Gallery <laughs>